So welcome to week three, everyone. Uh, this is probably the most important lecture of the entire semester, as this theory that we're going to go over today comes up again and again. So Newstat is considered really the dean of presidential studies. And there have been, of course, critiques of Newstat over the years. But really, his theory still largely stands. And the critiques are more like tweaks uh, to his theory as opposed to full on like destruction. So from last time, if you'll recall, we discussed the founding and how there really wasn't a consensus among founding fathers and how they conceived of presidential power. Uh, we also discussed presidential power generally, particularly as it's defined in the, in the Constitution and how um, people perceive that power today. But what are we going to cover today? Um, Neustadt thought those constitutional definitions of power uh, were really largely insufficient, insufficient in explaining how presidents actually wielded power. Uh, so we're going to talk about his theory a bit today. Um, specifically, we're going to go over the power to persuade, so who the president is persuading, and how the president uses his professional reputation and public prestige to get what they want. Um, and then we're going to conclude with a discussion of what a weak versus strong president looks like. So just a brief background on Neustadt. Who was Richard Neustadt? Uh, Neustadt worked under multiple presidential administrations. Um, he briefly, briefly worked in um, FDR's Office of Price Administration. Uh, he was a bureaucrat in Truman's Bureau of the Budget, and he worked his way up to become a political aide to Truman himself. At the same time uh, that he was working for Truman, he was also getting his doctorate at Harvard. Um, he left academia at the end of Truman's term, um, but then when Kennedy got elected, uh, Kennedy wanted him involved in the transition into office, and Neustadt was asked to be part of Kennedy's staff. Um, Neustadt declined, um, but Kennedy was seen leaving an airplane with this, with Neustadt's book, with this book uh, that we're discussing today, um, that he actually wrote his, his dissertation uh, at Harvard. So uh, really, presidents and politicians at the time saw his book, The Power to Persuade, as a how-to guide to be successful as a president or political leader. So I want you to keep in mind that, so yes, we discussed this as academics, but for a long time, this was considered almost like a, a how-to guide to be a good president, right? To get what you want done. So presidential power is considered the power to persuade according to Neustadt. Uh, ultimately, his contention is that presidents don't have a lot of unitary or solitary power within them. Instead, they share power with other actors, like Congress and the bureaucracy, which means that the executive needs to persuade them to get what the president wants done. So if the president wants a new health care law passed, he needs to persuade Congress and the legislators there to be on his side, and he needs to persuade the bureaucracy to implement it how he sees fit, right? So we're trying to persuade other actors to get what we want done. You'll note that persuade was in quotes there. So what is the power to persuade then? Is it just to convince someone to do what I want? Not really. Uh, Neustadt defines this persuasion as to believe that what he wants of them is what their own appraisal of their own responsibilities requires them to do in their interests, not his. In other words, oh, in other words, you convince legislators in Congress and bureaucrats to believe that to pass something the president wants is also in their best interest. It's more like bargaining. Right. This isn't persuading where you put like on your nice voice and you say like, oh, this is the best thing. Right. This is more like bargaining, bargaining. I do something for you. You do something for me. This is going to be in our both our best interests collectively. This makes it sound like a somewhat friendly deal, though, doesn't it? Persuasion, where if you do one thing, I can provide this other thing in exchange. And in some cases, that is true. That's what persuasion or bargaining is. Um, if you sign on to this legislation, I'll build a facility uh, in your state or appoint this person to a position of power. But the president can also be threatening, right? See LBJ here. 
I threaten to pull this funding away from this specific legislator, for instance. They are ultimately using their presidential powers for a reciprocal relationship, right? They're using their presidential powers and prerogatives, appoint people to power, um, put them on special committees, go stump for them, all of these things that presidents can do that no one else can do um, to get what they want done, to ask for a quote, favor from a legislator. It, it isn't always a nice favor though, right? You could also threaten to take something away. So who is the president trying to persuade? I briefly mentioned it earlier, but um, the president is trying to persuade Congress on the one hand to support his policy agenda, but he's also trying to persuade the bureaucracy. bureaucracy. The bureaucracy, after all, implements his agenda. So he needs them to be on his side to implement the policies how he envisions it, right? There's a lot of um, vague language usually in a policy, and so it gives the bureaucracy latitude for how to interpret it. So yeah, if he has persuaded it, the bureaucracy to implement it how he sees fit, then he will get what he wants. But how does he persuade them? Really, his ability to persuade the bureaucracy in Congress depends on two things. First is his professional reputation. Specifically, his past and current errors influence his ability to bargain. And how consistent he is influences his ability to bargain. So if he has made a lot of mistakes in the past, he's probably going to have a hard time bargaining, right? If you are always sort of messing things up, you're probably not going to do that well when trying to strike a bargain with a legislator or a bureaucrat. How consistent he is also influences his ability to bargain. So if the president waffles between one policy position and another, that makes it difficult to bargain with the legislature or the bureaucracy because they're having to shift back and forth, right? Which policy position does the president want? Was it the first one or the second one? So in that way, these two things really matter. It is also contingent on his public prestige. Really, his ability to get what he wants in some ways depends on his public approval. Um, part of what Newstat is arguing is the president should actually deflate the general public's expectations um, just so that they have low expectations for what the president can deliver on so that then when you do deliver something, um, you do like people are surprised and give you lots of approval for it. Um, but if you let people down, right, like if you tell the general public we're going to pass um, X, Y and Z and then you don't follow through, you're, you're letting them down and then they may not be on your side as sort of a bargaining chip in the future. OK. The ultimate conclusion of Newstat, though, is that Presidents who can persuade or bargain are going to be more powerful, but presidents who command, and that means telling Congress or commanding Congress or the bureaucracy to do what they want, um, do, to do the things the president wants, things like executives, executive orders. So executive orders are usually considered more like commands, right? If they receive commands, these are considered relatively weak. Right. This is because executive orders and these sort of administrative directives um, are more transient. Uh, these are policies that can really be changed quite easily or rescinded by a subsequent president. So if you got a lot of your policy agenda passed through executive orders, there's really nothing to stop a subsequent president from rescinding those. And so your policy agenda doesn't have a, a legacy to accompany it. Right. Moreover, uh, executive orders are really pretty limited. So substantial policy change usually can't occur through executive orders. Uh, substantial policy change usually only occurs through legislation. This is, this is generally speaking, there are some executive orders that of course are relatively substantial policy changes. Um, but substantial policy change usually just occurs through legislation, which requires Congress to pass it and the bureaucracy to implement it. In any case, though, strong presidents are those who persuade Congress and persuade the bureaucracy to pass and implement policy how the president uh, 
wants, right? Whereas weak presidents command through things like administrative directives and executive orders. So keep that in mind. So for today, we discussed what the power to persuade is, who the president is trying to persuade, as well as how the professional reputation and pre public prestige matter for the president's bargaining abilities. Finally, we talked about what a weak versus strong president is. So for discussion sections, we're going to be covering whether you buy Neustadt's theory, why or why not, and whether you think Neustadt left something out or that something wasn't as relevant during his time but is now. And finally, we're going to talk about um, uh, how you would categorize Trump or Obama. Would you consider them weak or strong? And we're going to talk about that a little more too. Okay, um, just make sure to watch the next video about critiques of Newstock because that's super important.